It wasn't really until the end of the 18th century that some of the huge intellectual and spiritual riches hidden away for centuries in old Sanskrit manuscripts uh, began to make a real impact in Europe. This was the time when Europe was going through that huge artistic and philosophical shift which we associate with the rise of Romanticism. And almost immediately, the core ideas of Indian philosophy struck a massive chord with some of the outstanding minds of the time. The great German philosophers, such as August von Schlegel, came to look on India as the place where, above all, spirituality and rationality were still combined in a harmony that he had felt was lost in the West. Gottfried Herder, in his book on the story of mankind, described India as the cradle of all human civilization. The composer Beethoven, towards the end of his life, wrote in a letter one of the most powerful statements of his religious belief, recognizing how Hindu philosophy expressed more profoundly than anything else, that God is immaterial. As he is invisible, he can therefore have no form. But from what we are able to see in his works, we conclude that he is eternal, almighty, omniscient, and omnipresent. The mighty one alone is free from all desire and passion. There is no greater than he, Brahma. And he ends his letter directly addressing Brahma, the Hindu god, in a prayer. You are the image of all wisdom. You are present throughout the whole world and sustain all things, sun, ether, Brahma. From then on, whether or not it was properly understood, we see Hindu philosophy popping up all over the place. In America, two of the best known examples were those mid 19th century transcendentalists, Henry Thoreau and Ralph Waldo Emerson, two friends who quoted liberally from the Bhagavad Gita in their writings. They particularly liked the idea, which made them unpopular with stricter Christians, that God is in all created things and that we must learn to recognize that. Thoreau even compared his Walden Pond to the River Ganges. When in the early 20th century, the great Swiss psychologist Carl Jung split away from Freud and developed his own highly original view of the workings of the human psyche, he was struck by how closely the findings of his own empirical work coincided with those given by the Vedas and the Upanishads. When Aldous Huxley, the English author of Brave New World, moved to California just before World War II, he was so impressed by the spiritual profundity of the learned Indian gurus and their American followers that he came across. In 1945, he published a book called The Perennial Philosophy. This showed how, in his mind, all the great religions at their deepest end have much in common. But again, it was the ideas of Hindu philosophy which were at the heart of his work and the rest of Aldous Huxley's life. Together with Christopher Isherwood, who was the author of Cabaret, turned into that popular film, and, and various others, they were members of the Vedanta Society of Southern California in LA, with a branch society, the Vedanta Society of Northern California in San Francisco. Throughout the 40s and 50s, and early 60s, they and many others wrote fantastic essays on Indian philosophy that are still well worth reading today, helping lay the ground for what happened next. Of course, the most famous popular example of the way Indian spiritual ideas were proving attractive to the West was the way they exploded into flower power, beginning in California, along with the crazes for yoga and meditation, which are still so prominent today. Nothing did more to put this into world headlines than the way in 1968 the Beatles traipsed off to Rishikesh in northern India to attend a course in transcendental meditation at the feet of the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. Um, much of their music at this time, just before the Beatles broke up, uh, shows Indian influences, not least through their collaborations with India's leading uh, celebrity sitar player Ravi Shankar. Ravi Shankar also recorded a wonderful collaboration, East Meets West, 
with keen Iyengar yoga enthusiast and world-class violinist Yehudi Menuhin. A much more historically significant group of Westerners who had earlier taken a much longer and more serious interest in Indian religious philosophy were the leading nuclear physicists in the first half of the 20th century who had been at the very forefront of science in their exploration of quantum mechanics and the inner mysteries of the atom. Among those were devoted students of the Vedic texts and in particular the Upanishads including figures like Niels Bohr, Erwin Schrödinger and Werner Heisenberg who all wrote not just about how there was much about the atom itself which was illuminated by those ancient Hindu writings but also how much they made sense of human nature and our relationship to the universe. Schrodinger, famous for his cat, uh, spoke of a universe in which atomic particles are represented by wave functions. He said, the unity and continuity of Vedanta are reflected in the unity and continuity of wave mechanics. This is entirely consistent with the Vedanta concept of all in one. Again, Schrodinger. The Vedas teach that we are more than physical bodies operating according to the laws of physics and chemistry. We, the eternal conscious self, Atman, are inherently connected to the greater whole, Brahman. And this eternal inherent connection is totally transcendental to matter. All living entities having free will are able to ignore this connection or recognize it. The Vedas teach us how to do both. And of course, the most famous glimpse of all into how deeply these great physicists were imbued with the Hindu scriptures was the exclamation of Robert Oppenheimer after he had witnessed the first ever atomic explosion in the desert of New Mexico on 16th of July, 1945. Oppenheimer had actually studied Sanskrit at the University of California, Berkeley in the preceding decade. His stunned response was to quote from where else but the Bhagavad Gita, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Although some of this may be well known, much less so is the crucial part played in the development of quantum physics by a physicist who was himself an Indian. We have all of course heard of that class of particles in the atomic nucleus which are called bosons not least because of the famous, eventually successful hunt for one of them, the Higgs boson. But how many people know how these subatomic particles got their name? Satyendranath Bose was born in 1894 in a little village in Bengal. A voracious reader and autodidact in a wide variety of subjects, ranging from physics and maths to literature, he became, in his 20s, particularly interested first in general relativity, Einstein's theory, and then in quantum mechanics, the inmost structure of the atom, which was only just appearing in scientific literature. Disagreeing with a paper by one of the leading physicists at the time, Bose sent another paper uh, explaining why he thought it was wrong. He sent it to Einstein, himself in faraway Germany. Einstein was so impressed that he translated it and had it published. Bose then came to Europe to work with Einstein, producing studies which identified the behavior of photons and other particles so convincingly that he and Einstein published their results together, reporting what was one of the most dramatic breakthroughs in the history of physics. Their joint work, soon known as Bose-Einstein statistics, was so groundbreaking that eventually another key physicist in the field, Paul Dirac, suggested that all of these subatomic particles should be called, after Bose, bosons. Thus did a largely self-taught young man from a poor rural Indian village give his name to a series of infinitesimally minute objects which are nevertheless crucial to the structure of the entire universe. We shall take this theme of Indian influence up to the present in the final two weeks of our course when we consider creativity and opportunity.